Thank you for tuning in to my third Q&A video. Some of the questions I'm going to cover in this video is uh, what is voice leading, how do you modulate, and um, how do you work on learning melodies, and also about classical music and uh, how to uh, transition from playing classical guitar to playing jazz guitar. And uh, please remember that if you have a question then leave a comment on this video and uh, maybe I can cover it in a later Q&A video or maybe I can cover it right away in the comments. And what also happens quite a lot is that other people, because there are a lot of people watching these videos who are of course also interested in jazz guitar and guitar in general. Uh, they will, might chime in with their uh, experiences or if they have like their approach to solving some problem or how they uh, think about certain things uh, that you're asking. So uh, there's always lots of stuff happening in the comments with that and that's interesting also for me to see what, um, what you guys think. So uh, if you have a question leave a comment but certainly also if you have an answer or if you have an experience then leave an answer as well. Let's just get started. I've been struggling with learning song melodies. What's the best way to learn and master a song? So it's true when you're playing something like a jazz standard then the melody is probably the most important part of what is going on. And uh, it can also be useful to know the lyrics because the lyrics are going to tell you how you can phrase the melody in a logical way. And for a lot of us I think it's also easier to remember the melody if we just have some sort of sense of the flow of the lyrics and know what the song is about. And, um, so for that I would say there is uh, there's good reason to listen to vocal versions of standards that you want to learn. Uh, and then try to listen to different versions and um, there are going to be a few things with learning melody because we're so focused on playing changes and, and our solos and improvising and stuff like that we're not too busy with how we um, how we actually reproduce a melody and how well how you learn a melody. It's not something that's coming up too often. Um, but I think it's very important to do so and I think there's like a preparation to part of it so um, probably if you find different versions listen to them I would really strongly suggest finding some good vocal versions my old uh, teacher always told me to check out uh, Ella so Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole because their versions are really clear uh, they will sort of stick to the melody they won't change too much they might change one or two notes and stuff and they're just really good also so uh, you get good versions of it and, and uh, that sort of strong versions that are uh, close to how the song really is with a lot of respect the, for the song um, sort of um, somebody who is maybe not so useful to check out themes from is uh, Sonny Rollins because I mean he plays he makes great things out of the themes but it's maybe not the place you want to learn it because he's gonna do different things uh, with the song and he's gonna just change everything that's uh, that he wants to change, which is okay too, that's also an approach but if you're trying to learn the song make sure you learn the song somewhere where you can actually figure out what it is that can be a little bit difficult um, one of the, in this sort of, this part of the preparation where you're just checking out different versions um, uh, I'll link in this description to a video by uh, the saxophone player Bob Reynolds because he made a video where he's uh, going through different versions of Autumn Leaves and sort of showing the history of how it's interpreted in jazz and also just uh, where it's coming from and this kind of research, if you have Spotify or Google Music or whatever uh, that can be really useful to check out a bit because it's going to give you an overview of the song and it's going to give you some hints on arrangements and uh, uh, and also just this thing that you're hearing a lot of different versions of the song is, is going to sort of help you if you just listen to them absorb what the possibilities are and also to some degree what the essence of the melody is. So so that's so much for listening and uh, the main point is like check some versions, check some vocal versions. Um, in terms of just actually practicing, so we play guitar, uh, don't underestimate how much time you have to spend learning the melody and don't worry it's time well spent. Um, there was a Kurt Rosenwinkel uh, masterclass somewhere, I think it's on YouTube or maybe it was like a recording I heard where he talks about how when he's learning a song he he can easily sit for one to two hours just playing the melody and then just to really get the melody and the good thing about really getting the melody is that if you once you have that you can even if you don't really know the chords um, I think you have something to sort of attach the chords to and you also have something you have the form which is actually sort of the, a, a level above where you really want to start um, above the chords so 
in that way that's that's that can be useful to do um of course if you do that you probably want to try different things with it uh different chord melodies or you know but but it's okay if you spend really a lot of time practicing the melody and checking it out and learning um different ways to harmonize it different ways to play it uh, and especially what I would suggest you do if you've never done that you don't have to do it every time you learn a song but uh, it can be good to take some songs and then just go through all uh, five or seven or six or twelve positions that you use for major scales I mean the standard is always in a key so you just find a new place on the neck um, I do that quite regularly and I also I still try to work so that I when I play this melody later uh, I can choose to harmonize it in certain ways and I can I have some uh, space to change this along the way uh, at least with some of them it's not always that I have that but I like that I like to have the ability to to focus on different things when I'm playing uh, in terms of how much I harmonize and give myself some room to to um, interpret the song um, so if we take uh, body and soul um, so that's in D flat so and so on and so forth. You can tell that it's, it's kind of easy to do. The good thing when you're practicing this, of course you're practicing to play body and soul and you're relying on, at least now, right now I'm very much relying on that I know probably the first note of the phrase or something like that and then I just play it by ear within that position, which is exactly how you want to know your positions. So in that way this is a great scale exercise because it's connecting a melody that hopefully you've listened so much to it that you can really hear it and you're just trying to hear it in this position. Uh, and you can combine it a bit with knowing the melody. You need to know the notes in the melody anyway, but um, you're sort of relying on on knowing the notes, but just as much on just playing the melody. So you're just saying, okay, I'm here and I need to play that melody, and my head is just singing the melody and I'm trying to play it. Um, and the first few times you do this, of course, it's really difficult, and there's going to be like places where where then it modulates in the bridge or something, and it's going to get really tricky, and and maybe you can't do it in one go, and you're practicing. That's okay, you know, um, and then it's a good practice. If you mess it up, then and you can fix it and figure it out. You're learning something, so that's fine. So maybe try and do that. Uh, I would really suggest doing that for, for a few standards, or you can do it also for lines. This is a good, great exercise for that, and in that way, not only learning the melody but also just really trying to hear something and play it, which is of course very important as well. Two more questions as well. One: What is voice leading? And explain in detail. Two how to do key modulation in a smooth way. Sorry if I ask too much, but this is already all of my main questions, uh, but yet are really important to me to, for me to know. So Randy that asked this question is also uh, following Gregory Bolomi on uh, his uh, YouTube channel, Acts of Creation. And uh, Gregory makes videos about, uh, I think he's mostly famous for making tool videos actually, but he's also made some really good videos on uh, Metallica and uh, Pantera. Uh, and he has uh, some theory stuff and uh, also some um, some stuff on technique and and, uh, and he also has a Q&A and Randy asked this question on uh, uh, both my video and also on Gregory's video and uh, first I said that I didn't want to answer this because voice leading is a fairly huge topic if you uh, really want to get into it uh, or at least it's going to be really long really easily um, but then Gregory answered it because he was asked as well, so I thought, well, that's a nice challenge, so I'll try and answer as well, it's kind of fun. Gregory's a really nice guy, um, we've been talking about working some stuff together also, but we didn't get to it yet, uh, so maybe in the future we'll, we'll do some stuff together also. But, um, so the voice leading thing. If we take a simple chord, the idea with voice leading is that when we play chords, we move from chord to chord, and as a guitar player, you learn to think in, in these, these complete chords. You don't really think about the, the basic uh, the construction of the chords, you just think about, okay, this is how I play a G major chord. When you start thinking about voice leading, because the chord thing is actually something that came later in music history. In the beginning, there was a melody, and then somebody came up with a second voice, and it was, just, it was later that people started thinking, well, actually, every time um, there's this in the melody, then we want to hear this and this under it. Ah, that's a chord. So that's, that was kind of how chords were invented. And um, voice leading is this way of playing chords where you start thinking about 
how each node in the chord is going to move. And uh, to keep that really simple, um, here I have like a C major triad in the first inversion. So just a part of this C major chord, but just the middle part like E, G and C. If that needs to move, oh sorry, if that needs to move to, um, to say F major, so we're in the key of C and we want to move to the fourth degree which is F, then there's a smooth way of doing that and that is to take each note um, of the of the C triad and then find the closest note in um, in the F and if we think like this then we get a nice flow in the in the movement of the chords so just to demonstrate what happens if we don't do that then you get stuff like this which sounds of course because everything is like moving far away or if I do the other one you can hear that everything is moving far away and it sounds a little bit unnatural because the lower voice is like oh sorry like this so that that's far away and it doesn't really work and so you want to use and you want to move from this C to an F that's close by and you kind of do that by leading by voice leading which means that you're taking instead of thinking in chords you think that you need to go from each note here to a note in the next chord. So the E probably wants to go to F and the G will probably want to go to the A and the C can just stay because it's in both chords. So we get this movement which is much more smooth then. And the same works in jazz and with more complicated chords you just have more notes to work with and you have a little you have a few more options but the main idea is actually that you just think about how you move from one chord to, a, to the next in terms of that everything is moving in a logical way. So it's moving stepwise or standing still as much as possible. Uh, so if I take an A minor 7 with a 9 like this and then I want to go to a D7 altered, so that's a D7 with a flat 9 and a, a flat 13, then G is going to go down to F sharp, C is going to stay where it is, going to go to an E flat, that's a flat 9, and the 9 is going to go to the flat 13, and then we have this one. And then we could voice lead, lead that to a G9. So. That's the general idea, how that works. So for modulating, how do you modulate from one key to, the, to another one in a smooth way? And uh, the way you have a smooth modulation, where you just don't jump to another key, is that you have a pivot chord. A pivot chord is a chord that's going to be found in, uh, in both keys. And the thing that maybe is a bit tricky if you're not very, um, very far in understanding keys and functional harmony and all the possibilities, because of course you have like the diatonic chords, but actually you have more chords than just the basic diatonic chords in the key, because you will have um, uh, you, you will have like 4 minor and sharp 4 and, and uh, sort of extended amount of chords available to you and I'm not going to cover all of the possible chords in a key um, also because there are just really a lot uh, and I think that's also a question of knowing enough songs where you come across it but the idea is that you have a um, you have a chord that's in both keys and in that way you use you kind of use that somehow to f make a cadence to another key and the basic idea is that you you find one chord and you uh, that you say, well, this is um, from this chord I can move directly to this uh, to this other key. Uh, so, what would be a good example of that? Um, if we just probably C major is the place to start. So, of course, some cadences you can just sort of keep in there, so, uh, and you can sort of quickly make uh, a turn. So, if I want to move to A major then we can actually, in C major already, even though it's not strictly diatonic, so that's a good example of that, we can have a cadence to an A minor chord, that wouldn't be really weird. So that would mean that a jazz cadence would be like a 2-5, so that would be like E half diminished, E7 flat 9, so A harmonic minor material, and then you would normally expect to go to A minor. But if we're modulating, so we start on C and then we have the cadence again, and then we're finding ourselves in A major. And 
the idea is that we are sort of tricking the ear by going, well, we have a C major, that's the key, and then we have a cadence that's fairly that's diatonic to the key in, in the sense that we just have a cadence to a, a, um, a chord in the key, which is A minor, but then we choose to sort of resolve it surprisingly to an A major chord, and that makes it sort of a smooth um, transition. And then the pivot chord here is, actually we have two pivot chords because we will have the B half diminished and the E7, so the whole cadence is just one, is, is a pivot uh, two. to have this. So you get a minor cadence resolving to major, which is possible. You can of course, in a major key, have a minor cadence. That's one of those cadences that, um, that would be one of those chord sets that I'm talking about, that you have more chords available than just the diatonic. So the basic seven steps, you you have uh, sort of minor variations and uh, and other things that you can uh, work with as well. And this is an example of that. So that's the way you, you sort of do that. And you can do that in several ways. Another one is, um, and I hope it's not like too far out in terms of functional harmony, because the nicer ones are usually found in um, uh, in in, uh, in sort of the extended parts. So already this one is it's like pretty close to home, uh, but if I have to think another one, so we're in C, and then um, let's just say we go from C to the C7 to F major, it doesn't necessarily really feel like a, we're just going to the fourth degree, so it's not really um, a modulation, and then a logical place to go from the fourth degree is to go to four minor, we can do that by doing F minor, E for seven, and then say, well, now we're in E flat. So we are resolving this, instead of going back, normally you would expect this, back to C, because it's 4 minor, so you get the 4, 4, 4 minor, back to the tonic, but in this case, we're making it a cadence. Most of the time when you come across, I think the best way to study cadences uh, and study modulations is actually to just check out a lot of songs, and the songs that modulate that I know of are for the most part standards. So, um, and surprisingly enough, most standards that you play probably don't modulate, which is something that, that a lot of uh, beginner students find mind-boggling, because they need to know all these scales, but actually the song is in the same key all the time. But, um, so yeah, that's the beginning of how you modulate. It's a big subject. What do you think is the best way for a classical guitar player to transition to jazz guitar? And out of curiosity, what do you think about classical music, in particular classical pieces for the guitar, like Recuerdos de la Alhambra uh, and uh, Villa Lobos Five Guitar Preludes? So going from classical guitar and classical guitar technique uh, and cl classical guitar music to jazz is of course quite a big step because classical guitar is uh, sort of the study of music that's on a page and you try to interpret it, um, and that's an art unto itself. Um, but you need to move to actually create music yourself and create your own lines, improvise stuff, improvise chords and mess around with the chord voicings and improvise with those as well. So that's of course a, a journey, uh, quite a long journey. I guess I I went from, I started as classical guitarist myself uh, when I was a kid, uh, but I went through blues and, and uh, other uh, and rock music into jazz and I was already playing that, so, so in that way I'm not directly going into jazz from classical guitar. Um, for me, what one thing that really made me more interested in jazz was that I was becoming more and more aware that I liked improvising, and I thought that that was uh, what I really wanted to be busy with, and, and also the music that I liked was, uh, I thought was improvised. I was really disillusioned at one point because um, my guitar teacher at the time was more of a rock and pop player, and he I think he turned me on to some Satriani, so I went to the library and I got a book of transcriptions from Joe Satriani, uh, and then I realized that I had a description, I'm not sure how it was, I had the recorded, the live recording and the studio transcription and it still matched, so I realized that he was actually not improvising at all, and I thought that was quite bad, and then I realized that a lot of people were not improvising, um, and I was very surprised about that. Uh, which uh, later I have I have a lot of respect for Joe Satriani and what he does. That's fine, but at the time I was I thought that was really silly and very circus-like. So um, so I never I didn't get into it like that. And then I decided okay, improvising is important for me. And that's what I like to do. Uh, so 
I guess when you're transitioning from a classical guitar to uh, jazz, there are a few things you, you a few aspects of it, um, and well, I think f uh, the first thing is technique. Um, if you're planning to play um, a guitar with with steel strings, then you probably, if you want to stay playing classical guitar, um, you have to watch out for your nails. I have long nails because that's what I'm used to, but I also know that if I play a long time with my nails, I, I just wear them out because the, the metal is... Uh, and you can probably do things about that and there are like... Uh, um, like the, some of the country players have stuff for it and I, Papithini also has some sort of system with putting plastic on his nails and stuff like that. I never really got into that. Um, Maybe I will later, I don't know. But for now, this is, it kind of works and then that's okay. But it does mean that sometimes you're wearing down your nails and then you have a bad sound for a part. I, uh, I just use this because that's what I'm used to. Uh, but if you're playing classical guitar, then the shape of your nails is a little bit more important than this to me. And um, that means that maybe you want to switch to playing with a pick if you're not staying on, a, on an island string guitar. You can do that too. There are really a lot of jazz players by now that, that work with island string guitars. Uh, and then you don't have that problem. Uh, you have probably other problems. I'm not sure exactly what that would be. Um, it's, well, I mean, it's an acoustic instrument, so there's going to be stuff where if your taste is more towards having lots of sustain, then that could be a little bit an issue with a classical guitar, I guess. But um, it's nothing you can't solve with a compressor. So. Um, so there's that, and then you need to learn right hand technique, and that's of course just, well, you can check that out, you know, beginning uh, plectrum technique, and uh, there, there are lots of videos on that. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is, um, so the whole improvising thing, I think you can just build that up. I think it's not, um, it's like everybody else, you, you start with a simple scale, start improvising, pick some pieces that are simple. Uh, so with hue scales, um, depending on what you feel like you can do, um, you can take some more motor pieces that have really clear changes that you can easily go through with Piantone scales, like Candlelip Island is one I use with students a lot, because it's kind of easy to hear what's happening, it's like, okay, now the chords are changing, and you need to change the scale, and then you get used to that part of it, so that, that can be useful, or if you uh, already have uh, good ears and a good sense of form, then um, start with blue bosser or blues or something and then just sort of go from playing with one or a few scales to more refining it and going into the arpeggios and then working uh, like that. That would be sort of the, the main other approach. And of course you should benefit from already knowing the guitar and being able to read music uh, and knowing where the notes are. So I think that's sort of the main thing. The biggest difference I feel when I'm playing with um, classical musicians and uh, compared to if I'm playing with pop musicians or jazz musicians is that uh, if I'm playing jazz then I'm used to the fact that the most important thing is somehow the tempo and the groove and in classical music um, then you don't really have that then the melody is the most important thing so if you're playing behind a classical singer they'll expect you they'll expect you to just follow their phrasing uh, and they're not really aware of that that might actually screw up the groove because that's not how they work uh, and that goes for having played with classical singers and classical violin players that that's the case uh, or classical uh, conductors have had some very interesting uh, things happening with uh, symphony orchestras and uh, pop rhythm sections where suddenly we had to change tempo in the most horrible ways but um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's how that works. It's, you have to be aware of it, uh, both as a uh, musician and as a composer, I'm sure. So, that th this whole idea of just playing in time is really important. It's important for everybody, but it could be that you just have to be aware of it, and if you're aware of it, that everything is time-related, then it's easier to transition from one to the other. For the rest, I don't really have too much sort of advice. It's pretty much just like you're starting like everybody else with improvising, but um, you have to um, you have to learn certain things and then because you already play the instrument to, at some level uh, you have some things that you get uh, that you don't have to work on and you can figure that out by yourself. It's, it's hard to tell really where you are with the different things. 
So, um, so so much for that. So since I played classical guitar, I also played some of the pieces. I never played the uh, was the Tarek, I think the Recuerdos. Um, but I played. I'm not sure if I played all of the preludes, but I played a lot of the the, the Villa Lobos. Uh, at least some of the preludes and also some of the etudes from him. And I like the. I think for me personally, in terms of taste, I don't really listen to lots of classical music. Um, I'm not sure why. Uh, and what I like uh, in, in the classical jazz, no, the classical guitar repertoire mostly was uh, was probably the more modern things. Uh, so so um, uh, so Villa Lobos was, was certainly some of that. And and um, I don't know. It, it, yeah. I, I just found that more interesting than, um, and also there, it's a little bit more rhythmical. Villa Lobos is, while it's still sort of with the classical flow, um, it, it's still more. You can really tell that it's like a South American with a, coming from a rhythmical folk culture, in my opinion, um, and it's very well written for guitar. Also, I think some of the earlier stuff when they were almost it feels like they're inventing the guitar. So the stuff I liked was really. Uh, well, I like some of the Tarega because it's very expressive, the romantic music, you can sort of uh, really uh, stretch the time and stuff like that, and if you do that, then that's nice. Um, and then I liked uh, John Dowland, which is actually lute, but that's just because it's really dark. I think I think that's why I liked it anyway. Uh, and I think it's very well written, I think the melodies are beautiful. Um, and then the more modern things, and right now I can't remember it because there's another set of etudes that I played also. Um, which also everybody plays, but I forgot what they're called. Remind me in the comments, I'll tell you if that's those. There's like one set of, I think, ten etudes that everybody plays, and I can't remember the composer right now. So, so much for, for my take on classical guitar. I actually know very little about it, and the stuff, if I listen to classical music, uh, and especially classical guitar, it's, it's only going to be modern stuff. Uh, my old teacher, who's the teacher at the conservatory in, uh, in Denmark, um, made some records with modern music that I really liked. And they also made some uh, some recordings of more straight ahead uh, classical music. That I, I have them, but I don't listen to it really a lot. So, yeah, that's that's how I think about classical music. So that was uh, some answers to some of the questions that uh, I got from you guys. I hope it didn't raise more questions and that it actually uh, gave some uh, answers that you can use for something. Um, but if it did raise questions, or if you have a question in general, then uh, leave a comment on the video. That's probably the best way for uh, for me to uh, to see it and also for me to pick it up maybe in a later later Q and A. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, if you see a question and you have something that you can contribute, so if you have a an experience or a, an, an answer or um, an approach like this, then uh, leave a comment on that as well. It's always useful for me, but also for whoever is asking the question. So I think everybody kind of wins from it. And um, if you um, want to support my lessons, then uh, check out my web store. I'll leave a link in the description uh, because if you purchase stuff from my web store, you're of course helping me uh, finding more time to make these Q&A videos and also to make the regular lessons. And of course, I'm already being supported by a lot of people and you're supporting me by subscribing. I'm really grateful for that. Another way you can help me is also by uh, liking this video and sharing it on uh, social media. If you're helping me spread the word, then more people can uh, participate in the discussion and I think uh, that's also good for everybody so um, thank you for doing that um, so yeah leave a question if you have one um, what else oh yeah uh, I'm leaving um, links to the YouTube channels of Bob Reynolds that I talked about uh, who has a saxophone vlog uh, he's the saxophone player of uh, uh, Snarky Poppy among other things at least sometimes he is uh, and he has a vlog he, he tries to, I think he makes daily vlogs um, I've watched some of them, I, you can't watch his videos every day of course, but uh, his uh, makes a lot of sense what the guy is talking about, so I think it's worthwhile checking out. Uh, and the same goes of course for a link to uh, Gregory's channel, if you're uh, into more uh, tool and uh, more uh, in the direction of metal and some of that stuff, then uh, also a lot of 7-string uh, and 8-string uh, instruments uh, stuff. He's made some great videos on scales for 7-string guitars and stuff like that. Uh, check out his channel. That's also certainly useful. So, yeah, that's it for this time. Leave a question if you have one. And uh, on to next week.